Hello everyone. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you my very good friend here, my former student, Matt Bassett. Matt is amazing. So how can I say, uh, so you know, as a professor here, we need all the personalities on that, you know, everybody. And we do love you all. We do love you, right? We don't jump anything. Okay. But when I met Matt first time, actually it wasn't this class. Do you remember Matt? Yeah, it was here when you met the first time. Because you know, I, I teach corporate strategies. Many students are seniors when they are coming, you know, to my class. All right. Or if they have this wonderful opportunity to take down to entrepreneurship and the family business class, because I'm the family business entrepreneurship program. So we were in this class and we were talking about, you know, uh, another class we have here, which is the Prague program, right? Prague. So don't live without one of these. We are running Prague again in, in the study abroad for spring break. And we talked about, I, I, I met the man here, and Rick started talking to me, telling me about, you know, that he traveled with Dr. Paul, uh, right, he went to Brussels, and then he went to Prague, and then uh, he is running businesses, and he is buying and selling and conquering an industry and doing all that. How old are you? 20? And then she said, oh, yeah, but I've been doing this for more than 10 years. No, okay, wait a minute, more than 10 years? And then the story came out that U.S. was not in order to nine years old, right? You know, what, even it was legal for you to sign, you're going to tell all the stories. So, again, here my, my, uh, my wonderful friend to introduce to you, uh, Matt Bassett, class of, um, of 15. And, uh, and made to be an entrepreneur, but everybody could be an entrepreneur, right? And who started a family business with his brother, Eminem Farm, but they are diversified. He just told me a story going to other industries and taking from the region or from the state of New Jersey on a national level. So, thank you very much. We have to talk. Good morning. My name is Matt Bassett. A pleasure to introduce you. I've sat here and seen a lot of these lectures, so I'll try to keep it as informal as possible because that's the way you guys are going to get the most out of it. So the first thing I'm going to ask anybody, does anybody here uh, have a business currently? Show of hands, does anybody that has a business? Or does anybody want to? have a business. Yes. What, what's your business? Um, I have a small art business. I do admission to the public. Anybody else? Does anybody here struggle? Another one, yeah. I have my business. So does anybody else well, here that doesn't have a business, do you strive to want to have your own business and be your own boss as an entrepreneur? Okay, so it's a good time. The rest of you, what do you want to do, go into corporate? or There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just asking the question here. So this is a hard thing to understand that there are people in business that work for a business or a firm. And then there's people that have ideas and want to take it and take their own idea to market and become an entrepreneur. But as an entrepreneur, you want to develop how to hire both kinds of people. Because within your entrepreneurship network, you want to have entrepreneurs working for you, and you want to have business people working for you that can concentrate on the day-to-day -day task. But you still want to hire entrepreneurs. And that's the hardest part of becoming a successful entrepreneur is to find a way to hire additional entrepreneurs to work for you so that they can create creating ideas for you so that they can bounce ideas off of you and you can bounce ideas off of them. So um, I've been doing this for a long time. It's scary to say I'll be 31 next month. And uh, I've been doing this for over half my life. I've been working for myself. I've had 11 successful companies. Uh, today I still operate five of them. And um, I just am starting a sixth company right now with my brother. Uh, we're getting into commercial real estate um, more and more. Um, and anyway, so a little bit about myself. When I was nine years old, I started out and uh, so, something as simple as selling produce, right? I became and always wanted more. So when you're an entrepreneur, you decide you have this mindset in you. And maybe you sitting here, you don't realize you are a potential entrepreneur because just follow my story. I didn't know I was an entrepreneur at nine years old. I started buying and selling produce, corn, tomatoes, peaches, whatever you have, right? 
And then it was never enough for me. The drive to do better on a monetary level, wanting more money, but also wanted to see my vision get larger across the horizon. I had this section over here, but I wanted to spread all over this side of the room. So by the time I was 10 years old, I started a retail division and a wholesale division. I had 17 people working for me at 10 years old, and I was their boss, people working in the 50 for me. Okay? The first year of my sales was over a million dollars. By year two, I had over $2 million worth of sales, and it just kept growing exponentially after that point on. Well, life is funny, right? So here I am at 10 years old. I'm living large, right? Some would say. But I never looked at the money. It was always how to get the more people, how to generate more, how to work, how to help others. By the time I was 14 years old, I decided that this was fun, but I needed another business on top of it. So I started a whole other landscaping business. And at this point, I had introduced my brother into my business with me. And that's become when I became from entrepreneur to entrepreneur and family business. Because now at this point, I introduced my brother to work with me. He was a co-founder of the landscaping business. And since that point on, since I was 14 years old, I've had a dedicated partner in every business I've done moving forward. But I will tell you all this. My brother is a businessman. He believes that he should just be the philanthropist and he should be the um, the owner. He doesn't have any extra additional ambitions or how to do something. If we're selling this podium here today, he'd be happy with selling this podium the exact same way it's made for the next 20 years. As for an entrepreneur, when you find that passion inside your heart, you become, well, that's not good enough. We could sell that with gold feet. We could sell this with different color paints, and now we have 10 different types of this podium. But now look at today, we have a podium here with a computer built into it too. That's entrepreneurship. You start with one and you have a greater vision to get to here. And that's what is a well-balanced um, working environment for my brother and I. He is very content in being in business. He loves to be in business, but he's great to do the day-to-day -day tasks and keep the business moving on. Whereas an entrepreneur, as where I sit and see as an entrepreneur, I get to keep envisioning the next levels of progression for our companies. How are we going to see ourselves in the next 10 years, even in, within the year? And where do you find the gaps? As an entrepreneur, the biggest thing you have to realize is you have to be able to have the mindset to understand the market around you. And I talk about this because Without knowing, I've done a lot of different uh, experiences in my life. When I was younger, I remember in 2009, I wanted to go abroad. I want to back up that actually in 2007, I wanted to go abroad, and I'll remember this story. And this is a lesson that taught me a lot in life. In 2007, I had the opportunity to go to Australia, and I was petrified to fly. To be honest with all the guys, I still hate to fly. And... Um, I was petrified to take 24 hours on a plane to see what the other side of the world looked like. I got my over my fear and in 2009. I took a three-week trip in the summer of my high school years and went across the country in, in um, the southern part of Europe. And I got to really see how the other parts of the world worked, how they were structured, and how they continued to, to do things differently than we did here in the States. While that might have been called a vacation to some people, as an entrepreneur, I was able to look at different parts of my vacation of travel and realize that there's other ways people do things around the world. And it develops your mind to start to think about, well, what can you be doing here and there? While still doing here, you can still be doing business here, and now you can come over to here and do business, and it broadens your horizons. So, you know, you might wonder why you do things in life. And so over the years, like Petra has said, um, you know, I got into college here. I came here to Elizabethtown and uh, I really wanted to go for engineering and business. And uh, believe it or not, uh, you know, life changes. So my business had grown so much when I came into college. I had started in my freshman year of high school a uh, hay sales company. So we sell products for racehorses and high-performance Olympian horses across the country. 
um, hay and the feed what they eat to get the energy for them to race and to perform. And when I got to college, I was kind of annoyed that my parents sent me to college. Maybe some of you still feel that way, but I had to take that frustration and figure out what to do. So I, I ended up realizing that I needed to grow my business even more. At the time when I came to college, this new business that I started, it was only four years old. And, uh, you know, it's, they tell you that the first five years are rocky in business, but I'll tell you that every day is rocky because one wrong move, you can you lose your entire company. Um, so 16 years later, I still have the company. So um, when I got to college, I really pushed myself to say, look, I can make this company go even more. And I became making it more and more nationally recognized. And now today we're a leader export of quality hay across the country, across the world globally. Um, my brother and I operate in New Jersey, Nevada, and Washington State. So we have three different locations that we uh, we run by. Um, so anyway, you might ask yourself here, what is the reason you want to become an entrepreneur? And some of you might be on the fence of wanting to know why you should become an entrepreneur. And I'll break this down for you real simple here. Entrepreneurship's about a word that I don't like to really use, but it's called power. And sometimes, you know, power is a, a risky word to throw out there in the air right now, because sometimes people abuse power. But as an entrepreneur, it allows you to have the power and allow you to become your own. You get to define yourself through entrepreneurship. You get to define how you want to see your life. Unfortunately, everybody has to create a job. You know, you have to generate revenue for yourself as an individual to be able to survive and live on planet Earth. That's a necessity. But as an entrepreneur, you can have the power to choose how you want to see your life go about. So um, the big thing of this power is you get to see your entire vision. And you can never lose sight of your vision as an entrepreneur. You have to keep seeing additional visions. Where I saw myself at 30 and where I see myself at 35 are two different things, but I still have to keep having a different vision because you'll find once you become successful to obtain your first goal, you have to create more goals because you're never satisfied as an entrepreneur. You become this support where you become successful and then you just become stagnant. You're happy, your emotions are very happy, but as an entrepreneur, it's it's you have to find the next thing to do because otherwise you can become very depressed. The dark side of an entrepreneur, and in order to be a successful entrepreneur, you have to understand that you have all this power of how you can envision your life, how you can control other people's lives, that you hire employees and hire contracts with other firms that work within you, other vendors. But you have to learn the hardest part of an entrepreneur is how to separate your, your mind from the business and have a social life, but then also find yourself a mentor, whether it's within your industry or in another industry so you can talk about it. Because as an entrepreneur, you have the power to bring down everybody. And uh, I'll share that part with you here. I'll share some personal stuff with us. A while back when I was a senior in, here in 2015, <laughs> I was renting a large piece of property that we were running our business through. And um, they came for sale. And um, my brother and I had the first right of refusal to purchase the property in our contract to lease it. But we ended up hitting a wall because the bank wouldn't finance it due to environmental issues on the property. It wasn't that we weren't qualified to buy it, but there was environmental factors that the bank wouldn't lend the money on because it was too risky. And, and you have to understand that, you know, at this point in your life, you're on such a high because you believe you can spend all this money. You've gotten free approvals from the bank to say you can buy this piece of property and now you hit this roadblock and how do you conquer it? And I'll share this part of this here. It really brought me down in my senior year of college here. And I got to a point where you start to question, are you doing the right thing or not? 
And this was the hardest part of my entrepreneurship career, I will tell you. Um, I did not have enough mentors. Mentors are the most integral part of being a successful entrepreneur. I will tell you that right now. You have to be able to talk things through to other people. Even if somebody doesn't understand your business, a good mentor is somebody that doesn't even understand your day-to-day -day business. They're there to listen and to just coach you through life and get you through that roadblock. At this point in my life, I ended up getting so, I wasn't clinically depressed, but just down. Well, was the business going to go? I couldn't find another property. I had a lease for four more months. And then otherwise, it, I was going to either sink or swim. And uh, I ended up finding another piece of property. But in doing so, I got myself in such a big funk and wasn't sharing it with other people. I started kind of mismanaging the business, mismanaging employees. Even though I had all this power, I created it almost to be like a, a negative work environment where people didn't want to work for myself or my brother. And believe it or not, you know, I told you I have a partner, but, you know, and um, my brother manages the day-to-day -day business and then with the employees. I don't really interact with the employees throughout every hour of the day. I'm more on the larger scale of the business, how the business is going to move forward, what new relationships we're going to bring with suppliers and vendors and new customers, relations, and that's more of my outlook. But my energy affected my brother's energy, which then affected the whole entire scheme's energy. And in doing, we've lost employees. So you understand, that's the big thing about the power of an entrepreneur. Even though you don't directly interact with somebody, you can allow them to sink or swim within your own company. And that was a hard lesson for me to learn. Um, I lost an employee, and uh, but as a successful entrepreneur, I knew I wasn't happy with losing this one key employee. He had been with me since we started the firm and uh, started the business, and it took me three and a half years, but I was able to re-obtain him as employment. Now he's a manager for our company, and he works day to day on the management scale of the business. But he left me for three and a half years because he couldn't see the vision anymore because I wasn't proud of the vision of the business anymore because. I felt like we were defeated. Um, so as you grow a business, right, you have this idea as an entrepreneur and you want to take it to market. So there's two kinds of, uh, I argue this with a lot of people in, in business a lot. There's, there's startup entrepreneurs and there's lifelong entrepreneurs. And as you go through um, your business life cycle as an entrepreneur and you you might find yourself at different phases, which is okay, I believe. When you start up a business and you're a startup entrepreneur, you want the quick, instantaneous result. You want to create a product or a service and take it right to market right away. And then you're looking at how can you sell that business, that project, that, you know, the service that you created or the product. How do you sell it and how do you get on to the next one? Because entrepreneurs are never satisfied. A successful entrepreneur is never satisfied because you always believe that you can do more and you can do it better. So you're constantly looking at how can you improve on your own self, but also improve within your own business. The other kind of entrepreneur that I like to now consider myself is, is a lifelong entrepreneur. So after you go through, sometimes people start differently, right? Some people start their own business and keep that business going on their entire life. They retire from that business, they sell it, they pass it down, they have a succession plan on how they're going to um, get out of the business and keep the business still alive. But these people are lifelong entrepreneurs. In order to be a successful lifelong entrepreneur, you have to keep looking within your business. I never thought I would like this. I always was always about startups. I told you I started 13 companies. But now I find that I do enjoy being a lifelong entrepreneur because I look at the day-to-day -day problem of the market that I'm in. A really successful entrepreneur can constantly evaluate and differentiate themselves from other people. There's people that, you know, sell this widget and they're always happy with selling this widget but they don't see over here 
that their competitor is going to come out with widget 2.0. And widget 2.0 is going to supersede all your sales of widget. And now these are where lifelong entrepreneurs are important in their business because they've already came to the market. You were a startup business, you created widget. You sold widget, you generated sales for the last five years, but now you have to turn yourself into being a lifelong entrepreneur so that you can see the new gaps of the market. The reason that you came out with your product of why you entered the marketplace to begin with. And now as a lifelong entrepreneur, you keep looking at, okay, I still have company ABC, but now company ABC is still selling the initial product, but five other products too, because we've created and see if we can foresee the gaps in the market. And that was a big tough decision in life. And, and, and for myself, I will say that you have to choose where you want to go. Startups are one of the most fun, energy-driven times of your life. It's a complete adrenaline rush going through your body 24-7 of how you're going to get your business started, how you're going to get your product or your service made, how you're going to market yourself, how you're going to finance your business, how you're going to hire people, how are you going to be able to obtain customers, how you're going to be able to keep uh, relationships with suppliers ongoing. It's a great high. It's the best high you'll ever get. But eventually you get so proud of that business that you've created as a startup and you have to choose. You get to this wall. You have to choose, do I sell and recreate myself or do I keep pushing and finding a way to go over the wall and expand the business? And that's when you find that you're going to be a startup entrepreneur or a lifelong entrepreneur. And part of being a lifelong entrepreneur, sometimes you have to realize that you have to hire additional entrepreneurs within your own firm. You have to be able to see that you're going to get a vision so big that you have to have other people generating ideas, even if you don't use their ideas and implement that into your day-to-day -day business. Their input is highly valued. That's why you're paying them a salary. They sometimes have to play the devil's advocate. They have to be able to talk to you, well, we shouldn't do it this way, we should do it this way, instead, so that way you don't fail. Sometimes the hardest thing of being an entrepreneur is you believe in your product so much that you become blind to what else is going on in the market. You're so focused this way that you don't see what's going on over here. And you have to find yourself a structure of employees and mentors that can bring this other stuff into you so that you're not just constantly looking this way. You're seeing the sidelines, too, of what the market's doing. And sometimes, you know, you don't have to just look within your own industry. You have to look at the whole worldwide global platform. And this is very hard to do sometimes. Um, you get so embedded in your day-to-day -day operations of being an entrepreneur and trying to build bigger and better that sometimes you do not keep reading the Wall Street Journal. You don't look at Bloomberg. You don't see what's going on in the world and what's potentially coming up. What could be here in the next 12 months? What can be here in the next 30 days? What going to potentially be the new trend in five years? And that's a very hard thing to do. And you have to find time for yourself that you can break away from the business and look at the rest of the world and stay educated. You know, we go, you, you all are great at a great college. Um, that, you know, they talk about educate for service here, and we talk about, you know, giving back to people, but you also learn that at this college, you know, they say a lot that it's lifelong learning. And that's true in anything you do, because you never will know everything. If you want to be a successful entrepreneur, you have to humble yourself enough to realize that you will never know everything. If you can know 10% of the true functions of your business, the other 90% are relied on other people. And you want to do good at those 10, but now you have to hire other people and contract with other people so that you can rely on them to keep you being successful. For example, you're all going to graduate here, maybe, hopefully, in the next couple of years, right? 
and you want to go out and start up a business, well, you're not going to know about all the legal structures of business and the legal market place, how things are changing and evolving every day on the legal platform. So the first partnership that you would need to do and create is find a good lawyer. Somebody that you can trust and somebody you can talk to, more importantly. Somebody that you feel comfortable talking to and expressing your feelings and your passions of why you're adamant that you will not back down off of an issue or, or you will always push through on something. Because at this point, you're going to start your, your idea. Take it to market. You don't have time to go to law school and learn everything. You cannot delay going to market. When the market is ready for your idea, you have to jump. It's at this point, when the market is demanding your idea, you cannot sit on the fence and say, should I do it or should I not? As a successful entrepreneur, you have to say, if you want to be successful, I've got to take the risk now. <laughs> the bigger the risk, the bigger the reward. Throughout the entire your entire career as an entrepreneur, it's all about risk. How big of the risk can you take? How much of your time can you devote to something and still be continue to be successful doing what you're already currently doing? You have to learn how to manage your time and how to use partnerships with other people and other firms to do it. I'll tell you this much. When I started, I used to do all my bookkeeping. I used to pay all my own bills. I used to do all, a lot of my own legal work. And that was my passion. I liked business law. Now I had three different attorneys uh, within different firms, which then they have a whole payroll of their own employees that do work for me and can work on projects for me at the same time while I can still start seeing my vision to move forward. And then you have to find yourself a good partnership with an accountant because you cannot know every tax law. That's a full-time job just learning that. There's accountants, there's lawyers, and then there's entrepreneurs. As an entrepreneur, you have to keep moving forward. You have to dedicate your time to seeing the next vision and getting your product to the market and then finding ways to keep it at the market so that you can see the next phase two vision and phase three and phase four and et cetera. It keeps going on and never dies off. So you might ask yourself, you know, I, I came up with a list here of what really makes you a true successful entrepreneur. And I will say this, and I'll start with this biggest word. If you're a rigid person and you don't know how to bend and work well with others and be flexible and understand that things come up in life and they, they can crush all your hopes and dreams, you have to be flexible. That's the most important thing I believe in today's market worldwide. To be a successful entrepreneur, you have to be flexible. When your plan of going to market fails because there's a new regulation that doesn't allow your product to go to market, you have to be flexible and say, there's got to be a loophole. Let me find the loophole so I can still take the product to market. Or when, you know, you will have to go to a meeting to meet with an investor so that you can get startup capital to be able to fund your project so that you can take it to market. You have to be flexible in your own social life and say, I will sacrifice going out with my friends or going out with my girlfriend or boyfriend so that I can meet with investors so that I can get capital so that I can move this project forward. So flexibility is one of the biggest key components, I believe, in order to be a successful entrepreneur. The other thing is, you can learn a lot of information here at this school. You got four years to learn everything you can. Embrace on that now. But then continue with that drive to learn and learn from others. There's so many people out there that may be below you or above you. But I'll go out on a limb here and say that 90% of good information comes from the people below you. Because the people that do the day-to-day -day tasks, working for your competitors, that are going to be your competitors in your market, will share you more reasons why their your future competitor is failing and they're not succeeding in the market, which is creating a gap for you. Those day-to-day -day people working on the 
the lines of manufacture know the weaknesses of their product. Those people that are performing the service, if you have a cleaning business and they have a staff of five people and three people go over here to this office complex and clean and two go over here, these people with three might say, well, we're becoming inefficient because there's not enough work for three people. We're driving the company down on um, profit. We're charging more. So if the simple as a cleaning business, now you talking to them will tell you, well, if I hire one or two people, I can cut my cost down. I can charge less, but make a bigger profit margin and then scale to be a larger scale business to now generate more profit. So learning from others is a, a very key component, a uh, big component, I believe, in becoming a successful entrepreneur. And then quality versus quantity. When you talk to people, you have to give them quality information, stuff that they can believe in, but it's also being able to be backed up by actual facts. A lot of people try to start up, start up businesses and they blow all these statistics that aren't factual. They try to make it seem better than it is to investors, better than it is to potential users and in their sales tactic. And then they don't ever succeed. They fail at the market because they have so much quantity of, oh, it's such a great product. If you use, you know, if you drink this red Red Bull right here, not to pick on this guy, you know, he's going to have more energy at the gym than you drinking your Gatorade bottle. <laughs> That's why he's drinking two and you're just drinking one. But there's no facts right there. I didn't present any facts to back that up. I just gave you hot air. Now people don't buy it. You didn't want to buy that Red Bull yet, did you? So just because you have a lot of hot air, it doesn't do it. It also works within your own people. As an entrepreneur, you have to motivate your employees. You have to be their coach. And if you can give them one good thing of motivation, it's better than trying to find five things that don't really come from your heart. Just think about it on your own personal level. If you just... As simple as from when the time you were born, all you want is your mom to hug you. All an employee wants you to do is tell them they did a great job and they mean something. Say, you really did a great job today. You getting that report done today really saved the company. We really needed that done. Good job. Thank you. That's all. But if you went in there and just says, ah, oh, you know, you blow up a bunch of smoke, say, oh, well, you know, Thanks, somebody else could have done that, but you know, you really did a good job and you know, just kept going on and on and on. Well, it loses its value. So when you talk, you have to really learn how to say quality things over quantity. And then you have to be ambitious. And this is where I'll go out on a limb and say, entrepreneurs are born and they're not creative. Within your heart today, you're either going to be an entrepreneur or you're going to be a business person. There's nothing wrong with being either one. But as an entrepreneur, you have characteristics that you're willing to sacrifice your entire life and put it on hold. And just you have the biggest drive and, and you believe in everything you have going for you right now that you will do anything to the city and go to market. And then you'll do anything to keep it in the marketplace. And you will fight for it until you're blue in the face. And you're ambitious. You don't value sleep. That's a key big thing as an entrepreneur. You cannot value sleep. You cannot say, I have to get 10 hours every day because guess what? The guy working on your manufacturing line making your product falls out sick today. What are you going to do? You have an order for 100 pieces that have to be assembled. You have to be able to humble yourself and say, I don't need to sleep tonight. I'm going to put them together. That's when his Red Bull is going to come into play. But, uh, you know, you have to be able to be ambitious and have to be able to learn how to take risks. You have to learn how to put yourself out there and you have to be able to learn how to put yourself not above everybody, but as an equal. But at the same time, you have to learn how to keep your eyes going forward. So you cannot be standoffish within your own market. When people want to buy a product or a service from you, you have to be able to communicate with them. You can't say that you're better than they are, but you have to be able to see through that and do that function 
while you're also looking here to continue to grow your business. The other thing is you have to stay updated. And this ties in also with communication and you have to learn how to communicate with the people you hire. You have to learn how to communicate with your suppliers. You have to learn how to communicate with anybody that you contract services with for legal advice, for financial advice, with relationships with the banks, how to talk to your accountant. Then you have to learn how to communicate within your own personal life of what's going on with you. Because you still, as an entrepreneur, you don't ever get to shut the door at 5 o'clock and walk away from it. Your mind's constantly going. So you have to learn how to communicate your mind and what's on your mind to the people that you care about in your own social aspect of your life and within your family so that they understand that you're not always, you're not always here because you're sometimes here. You might be physically here, sitting here at the dinner table eating dinner, but your mind is somewhere else. You're thinking about the next thing. You're thinking about how you're getting tomorrow's orders done because you know you got three guys on vacation, your secretary's out on you know maternity leave, and now you're sitting here going, well, how am I going to answer the phone, take orders, and produce the orders? But then you have to also learn how to balance your time to stay updated like I talked about before, with the market. You have to learn how to become a peer within the market of your industry. You have to learn how to talk the talk of your industry and how to become a competitor, but also an alliance. You always are gonna be the person's competitor, but you also wanna be sometimes their alliance so that they don't cross you. Learn how to, you know, everybody right now in college, in college, it's fun to be in a club, be on an athletic team, to have a social interaction outside of the classroom, right? But learn how to do that when you leave college. Learn how to become on a board or on a council that is within your industry so that you're a, a looked up here. People look up to you for advice and for information. But even though you're sitting there and people are looking for you for information, you can turn to your side to the person you're sitting next to for information too. So you're able to use your peers to stay updated on your market. Then you have to stay updated within the worldwide global platform. We all operate on this global marketplace today. It is a global economy. What we do here in Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania can be done anywhere within the world and anywhere within the world can bring it to Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania. Then you have to learn how to take risks. And some people here are looking and feeling like, well, I don't even want to take a risk to sign for my first part. But then there's people that say, okay, you can either sink or you can swim. A good mindset you can be, become as an entrepreneur is say, you won't be the first person to fail. That was some of the best words that my grandfather gave me when I was nine years old when he handed me ten dollars and says, Here, I'll, I'll invest ten dollars into your business. But you have to pay him back in three days. Twenty dollars. So you have to learn how to take those risks. But when he handed me the ten dollars, he says to me, You won't be the first person to fail, and you won't be the last person to fail. But then he follow up and says, you won't be the first person to succeed either. So good luck. That's not with me since I was nine years old, and I still do that every day. I still think to myself because as successful as I am at 30 years old, and I'm blessed to have that success, you still get in your head about, well, but I still fail. So I'm going to continue to start up another venture. Or should I just stay stagnant within the business? Or do I need to still become a lifelong entrepreneur in my business that I have today? Right now, I'm doing both. I'm starting up a new startup venture. And I'm being a lifelong entrepreneur within the one business that we have. Um, but the bigger the risk, the bigger the reward. If you don't put yourself completely out there, you're never going to be able to take over the entire marketplace. If you believe that you're going to work for somebody else and start your own venture startup, 
You're not going to be able to do it. You have to become the mindset that you can do without. I don't need the new iPhone. I'm fine with an iPhone 13 right now. Even though your friend got an iPhone 14, I'll do without the, the, the I'll stick with my 13. It's paid off, but that's a thousand dollars that I can put in my new venture startup. I don't need to go on this vacation with my friends because there's five hundred dollars for the weekend that I can put to my new venture startup. I could take the time to see my friends, or I could take the time to educate myself on what the market is in need of right now to take my project to the market. It's all about risks. It's all about what you're willing to give up in order to get. And you have to have that balance, and that's sometimes a tricky balance, and that balance is always going to change in your life because there's different phases, different times of your business, different times of your new startup cre uh, venture creation because as you take it, you might be waiting for funding. So then you start able to maybe blow your mind down, see your friends a little bit, get new positive vibes, and then proceed forward. But you can never lose sight of your business. You can never lose sight of your baby. When you're an entrepreneur, you have to remember that before you had the idea and brought it to market, it was never there. It's like a newborn baby. You have to care for it from the time you have the idea in your head until the time you create a succession plan on how it's going to phase out as you walk away from the business. Sounds a little bit more, right? But it, it's the truth. You care about what you create so much. It's your passion. You eat, sleep, and drink it every day, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. So now you have to figure out how you're going to take it the rest of the way. You have to learn how to be a sailor. You have to learn how to sell yourself first. Before you can sell your project, you have to fully believe in yourself to be able to sell yourself to employees, to the bank, to a lawyer that wants to partner up with you to put the time and the energy into creating the legal structure of your business. And then you have to learn how to sell yourself because nine times out of 10, a sale is a personal interaction I'm going to buy from you because you wore that yellow shirt today and that blue hat instead of you wearing a gray shirt. Simple as that. That looks happy to me. That looks dull. No offense. <laughs> <laughs> but your appearance, the way you talk about yourself, all plays into your sale. And then you have to learn how to continue to sell yourself to be able to broaden your market. <laughs> The market's only this big, right? How much of the market can you penetrate? And through your sales and through the way you do yourself, you feel about yourself and you feel and have passion about your product, you can either upsell or downsell. The one thing I'd like to finish up with here before we go into questions and answers is an entrepreneur is truly all about passion. If you have a central passion and you want to take it to the market, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with, you know, you, you hear about all these Fortune 100 companies, but there's only 100 of them. Nobody looks about how many millions of other small businesses operate every day in the U.S. alone. Because the media wants to talk about the Fortune 100, the Fortune 500, but not about all the other millions of small businesses that are the backbone of the American economy. So it doesn't matter what you choose to take the market. If you're an entrepreneur and you're passionate about it, the first thing is to figure out how do you generate revenue for your passion? Because if you have a passion within yourself and it's not tied to monetary you know, income for yourself that you want to make money off of it, you're able to take it to market faster because you're not worried about generating a paycheck from it. 
Because for the first couple of years, it's going to be tough. But there's no business too big or too small to become an entrepreneur. I've done all kinds of different businesses. You know, I've had a, something as simple as a, a screen print and brewery do shirts on people's shirts, you know. It was a pretty easy thing. It was already stuff people did, but I had a passion for it at one time. I took it to market. I made money off of it. I loved it. It was fun. I never thought I was going to work because I had a passion for it. It was a part of art. It was a part of um, of what I enjoyed to do. It was kind of therapy for me in a sick way. But I was able to take it and make it a business, create it, and then sell it off. It was a startup. It was a successful business. And I sold it off and took that money and then reinvested it into a new venture creation. Started up another startup business. And they just kept building upon themselves. Right now, I've been doing the same business. My main company is called Eminent Farm. I've been doing it. It's been a passion for me uh, for 16 years. We're in our 16th year of business. Uh, we just celebrated the beginning of September. And, uh, you know, what the company looks like, I, I like to talk about this business because this ties in all aspects. I'm sure you guys don't all just sit here and talk about entrepreneurship. We talk about franchising and finance and management. So when I started a company, it was actually called Eminent Hay Sales. And um, 16 years ago, it was called Eminent Hay Sales. And all we sold was hay, bales of hay. We didn't make the production. All we were doing was we saw a gap where farmers were producing a product. And they didn't know how to market it to the market. So we filled the gap. We were the middleman. We were a broker. But I had a new venture creation. We worked with people, growers, and people that supplied us coast to coast. And then we distributed it from their farms. And eventually phased into now we have different divisions. So in 2013, we created a production division. And that's when we started Eminent Farms, which acquired Eminent Hay Sales. So we still have the business of Eminent Hay Sales of the brokeraging business. And then we have now production. We actually went into farming. It was a passion for my brother to farm. It was his passion that he believed could benefit the business. So at this point in our business relationship between the two of us, this is when he was truly the entrepreneur for once. And he believed in something and created a new venture creation to generate the production. And now we farm and produce an agricultural commodities too. Move fast forward into 2014, we started buying franchises and buying up licensing agreements. All stuff that you, you will talk about if you haven't already, three or four years of Elizabethtown College, you'll learn about all this stuff about licensing agreements and franchising. So now, and then as far as we operate under seven franchises, and we have 13 licensing agreements, plus we have the production and the brokers and we buy and sell. So it's all different phases, but when you look back over 16 years window, you know, I never recreated a new venture, I just built upon it. I've learned how to be that lifelong entrepreneur to build my business so that it's this way and this way. So we've generated more sales, more profit, more revenue. We've also covered out more. We have different divisions. Then we also have different locations now. We, you know, we service out three locations that handle the entire globe. So as something as simple as anything you want to do, you can become an entrepreneur. And that's what I want to leave you with. It doesn't matter what your passion is. It doesn't matter what your desire is to become, you know, to become a vision for yourself. Do not allow anybody to downplay your passion, your dreams, and your goals because you can do it. Thank you. Questions. Funny questions. Okay. What activities did you in front of the town that you feel like you know to do as an entrepreneur? That's a good question. Um, 
I was thinking about this the other day, so I uh, talked a little bit about you know becoming on boards and stuff. So now I sit on the county develop agriculture development committee. I sit on the local agriculture board in my township. Um, and you know, in this room was I don't know if it still is, but I was part of student senate. I was the class treasurer all four years. Started out as a joke freshman year, and uh, that followed through all four years. But you know, thinking back to that, that was something I was very involved in. But it really teaches you how to work well with others. Teaches you how to run an efficient meeting. Teaches you how procedures work. How to work with different agencies. If you just look within the school, I was just thinking about this about two weeks ago. So it's a good question. You know, you would have to request money, even though your class had money, with the finance office, be able to approve an event that you wanted to do. It's the same thing as in business. You have to ask your investors to give you more money so that you can do what you want to do, so that you can move forward into the next phase. And then, you know, it's all, you know, student senate at the time, I hope it still is, but it was very formal structure when they had the meetings here. And you, you really learn how to work through meetings and how to follow Robert's rules and how to communicate your point across in a diplomatic way. And throughout your life cycle of your business, you're going to find yourself. You know, I, I had this thought in my head that I would probably never get sued. You never want to get sued. And now, um, unfortunately, that's the necessary evil as part of being in business. You have to learn how to hold yourself in a courtroom. You have to learn how to be able to talk to a judge. You need to learn how to talk to, you know, the plaintiff or the defendant, depending on which side of the party. You need to learn how to talk to the jury. And I believe Senate really taught us all that. That was about, you know, it, it rounded me as a person, I will say. It was tough for me. That was probably one of the only things I really did outside of the classroom. Um, I will follow up with this. I took it took advantage of both the, um, it was hard. When I was in college, sitting here like you guys are, I had anywhere from, five to 30 people depending on the time of the year working for me and i was running my you know running my business off my cell phone um two hours away so but then i knew i could never study for all for all semester but i did take a um take advantage of going to brussels and uh you know studying how the eu works and then i also um did the prog trip and you know those were two different opportunities where I was able to sacrifice a short amount of time outside of the classroom and get to study abroad, give up some of my you know winter break and my spring break, but I was able to see how the world still worked. And I would say that in those three things, I think you you know those were probably the top three things that I took away from Elizabethtown College that really have shaped me into seeing how the world still works and how to work within with others. Any other questions? Huh? Any other questions? How much influence your life of doing abroad in Australia? And do you think that your life will be different if you didn't go? So I know I'll follow up with your question. I never did go to Australia. I was scared. <laughs> so that was a, a uh, that was, as far as I'm concerned, that was when I realized that you can be your own worst enemy. You know, everybody likes to talk about, oh, haters hate me, and but Nobody likes to talk about the deep, dark secret that you're your own worst enemy. So I talked myself out of that, and then I finally talked myself into going to the southern part of Europe, which was good, because then that's when I learned that there's more, at this point in my life, I was really kind of in a regional area. I hadn't seen what the whole world had to offer. I didn't realize until I went to Europe that there's products being still produced in the U.S., it's hard to believe, that get exported to Europe. And if they're doing it for whatever the product is, well then, if my product I believe is superior than your product, I should be able to export my product to Italy. My hay is greater than your hay, and that you grow in Italy, you'll pay to export my hay, and or you'll pay to import my hay to Italy. And that's when I realized that there's so much more of this world than what we just see on the day to day. And what's sad in today's world is, and it's getting worse, the media doesn't show you what you're going to find. The media doesn't show you all the opportunities that are, that are out there. So you have to put yourself out to have experiences within your own life 
so that you can see other gaps. Because if the if we relied on the news and to just show you that oh consumers are demanding that they have this, well now they just broadcast it to, to everybody in this room. Now everybody can take that idea and run it to the market. Everybody's going to fail except for one person. But if you find the gap here and then find it here in your heart, you'll be able to get to the market and be successful. I have a question. So we have a Korean comparison class, EA 105. We learned about the importance of personal branding and a company brand. What is your company brand? So our our company brand is uh, we have we have a logo on everything we do, and then we have a, we've stuck with the same thing since two thousand eight quality hey at an affordable price. And sometimes people question that a lot. You know, is it affordable or you know they they mislead affordable with cheap. It's affordable. You can afford it, but I'm not going to be the cheapest. But my quality is going to be superior. And we followed that through with all of our franchises we bought. We now are in a, we distribute pet food and then livestock feed. So they're made by the same companies, companies like Doreen and Nutrien and Triple Crown. We have the franchises for them. But we choose the franchise partnership, even within the franchise, we choose what we're going to distribute and stock in our warehouses based off of what we find superior within the other competitor brands. So we don't carry their entire portfolio. We carry pieces of it so that we still stay true to our brand. And then on myself, I always live that do unto others as you would do unto yourself. And what you give to somebody pay it for. And uh I didn't get to talk about this um but when I was 14 years old I learned a lot about the law. Um, I got a zoning violation for selling produce in front of my parents' house. Now, mind you, this is a, a wagon and a tent in front of my parents' house when I was 9 to 14 years old that generated me millions of dollars. All jokes aside. People become greedy. People become envious. And then I got a zoning violation. And I remember this guy come up to me. didn't know me from Adam. He was another farmer in the area that was stone birds. He was a competitor of mine. Now, I don't think he realized how much money I was generating. And he comes up to me and says one day, he said, I hear what's going on with you. I hired you an attorney. And I looked at him and go, you really think I need an attorney? He said, you're darn right you need an attorney. And I'm going to hire you this attorney. You're never going to pay a penny for it. And this guy's going to fight for you. This guy paid, this is a God's own truth, he paid for me uh, for three years of legal counsel and would never let me repay him. But it, within your own self, it's my obligation now to help other people. When somebody comes to me, it's my obligation, I believe, to help somebody else better their own business. And, you know, you come to a point in your life that, you know, sometimes you lose sight of that. But it's very important that you, you balance yourself. You have to humble yourself. As an entrepreneur, when you're successful, it's very, you can always feel like this, but you sometimes have to get back down to here and, and being able to help other competitors or other people in the industry that they're not a competitor, humble yourself. So, in the same note, how does a fish know that the whole universe is even just water? Right? No idea. And as you take the fish out to the water, you take in the same note, right? You want to get out of the water to out of your comfort zone, so it won't be any professional session on Friday. Next week on Thursday at 7 p.m. We are all invited and get one of the these brochures. So, what do you think, right? Wow, M and M Marks, such an amazing, so, such an amazing start on that. I promised you a show some of my students from strategy are here, wonderful. Um, but again, this is about entrepreneurial spirit, you know, I mean, I, I really want, I consider myself an academic entrepreneur, but again, this is the, this is the spark, this is the energy, right, that, that inspires us all as, as professors here as well. So, many thanks.